So what I think is interesting about Charles Bronson is that he was actually, when he first got incarcerated, he was only actually in there for seven years. I mean, I call them psychopaths, but you could e equally, I mean, they may well equally be a, a sociopath. He's called Rocky Bennett. So Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, what's interesting about him is that I think that he was psychotic. Dr. Das, how are you, sir? Really good, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on. Really looking forward to our chat. Oh, absolutely. Um, what an area of life that so many people are shielded from, so much stigma around it as such, and yet it's utterly fascinating. Um, I think many people, I think it's quite a sort of, uh, it is quite well known these days that most people have suffered some form of mental unwellness from on, on very varying degrees. I know I certainly have from chronic addiction to to um, psychosis and and all the other kind of you know can, other conditions in in between. But before we talk about that, um, do you want to just uh, hit us with what's the sort of worst case you've been involved in so yeah good question i think the most extreme case or the most emotionally draining case was when i gave evidence in a criminal court case for a murder charge so this was an 18 year old girl we'll, we'll call her yasmin that's not her real name uh, and she was unique in that she had no history of mental illness no previous criminality no drug and alcohol use so there were no risk factors and completely out of the blue she became psychotic uh, and she smothered and killed her three-year-old nephew who she was babysitting for. So it's obviously it's such a tragic case. At the time, she had these, she was harboring these delusions. So she believed that the nephew had demons inside of him and that she needed to, to save him by smothering him. And she believed that she could reincarnate him. So this all happened around 2014, I believe. And obviously the, you know, the police came around when, when the rest of the family discovered what was going on. And she went into remand at what was then Holloway Prison. And that's where I assessed her. And I eventually got her transferred over to the medium secure female unit where I was working. Uh, and assessed her over a, a period of a few weeks and I gave evidence at the Old Bailey for her murder trial and for me it was it was such an impactful case for so many reasons first of all obviously the actual nature of her offence was completely horrific inexplicable uh, you know it seemed sort of random came out of nowhere but then also it was quite educational for me because I was I was a junior psychiatrist at the time and I'd got to give evidence in terms of not guilty by reason of insanity which I'm sure you've probably heard the phrase psychiatric defence and the other thing was that part of a rehabilitation, so basically upon my evidence, she ended up going to hospital rather than prison, which is the right place for her because she was completely psychotic. Uh, and then part of her rehabilitation was reconnecting with her family, including her older brother, who was the father of the child who, who got killed. So I was kind of sat in a room during this family therapy, which was like on a weekly basis over many months. Uh, and just, yeah, just being part of that, of the emotional struggle there was just really heartwarming and kind of eye-opening for me. Gosh, it's just my heart goes out to everyone just hearing that story. Because, of course, we live in a society where, as I mentioned earlier, stigma is is, is always an issue. And in a case like that, there'd be so many people to them it's black and white well she's evil lock her up yeah. da, da, da. not really not understanding that it's nothing to do with a a moral decision whether to commit an evil act it, it's it's completely out of her control and that she is actually the equal victim in this equation yeah how did the how did the family did they accept her you know back it back into the fold or so I'll, before i answer that i'll just sort of expand on what you said i think w the patients that i assess the defendants during their criminal trials you could argue that they're kind of doubly stigmatized because as you say they've got 
a mental illness and most of them have committed some sort of horrific violence so yeah it really is a kind of side of society that nobody really wants to people want to you know ignore or, or lock away lock up and throw throw away the key i think in this particular case yasmin was really lucky because her family were very understanding they're very tight-knit um Eth ethnic minority family so they all lived together like she lived with her siblings before this all happened uh, and her rehabilitation was was you know it took a long time so she was in a hospital for about three or four years altogether uh, and it took about a year and a half of medication just to help cure her psychosis so her family were quite understanding I think her parents were how do I put this they were a bit I mean, I, I never met them before this incident, so it's hard for me to make a comparison, but they, they seemed at least on the surface f willing to take her back, back home, but there wasn't much interaction. So I don't know whether that was just their natural dynamic or whether despite them taking this magnanimous step, they still harbored you know, an unspoken degree of resentment. I don't really know. Gosh, and, and she of course got to live with that for the rest of her life as, as well. Yeah. So what happened was it took it took about 18 months before we found the right combination of antipsychotics. Part of that was because she refused medication initially, which means that we had to use the, the powers of the Mental Health Act to physically detain her and in, inject her a few times before she agreed to take tablets. And after about 18 months, her, her psychosis finally lifted. And then, as you say, it, her, what, her acts came crashing into her reality. So she, she finally understood after all this time the consequences of her action. Uh, and as you'd imagine, she just, this massive wave of depression came over her. So that was like the second part of her treatment phase. So what is it then? Because, and, and for friends at home, we, we, um, we're going to come on and tell Shahan's story. But uh, I just wanted to go straight in with sort of some of the fascinating stuff so that... Um, Perhaps people who wouldn't ordinarily watch this kind of podcast will just stick with us a bit longer. Um, but in my case, it was quite black and white. I, I took a load of really strong chemicals and I took them for way, way, way too long. And the way I describe it to anyone is the, the, the fine synapses in my brain started to, you know, ra rather than fire co cohesively, if that's the right word, or, or, or in order, they all started getting higgledy-piggledy. And as such, my thoughts became rather delusional. Yeah. Um, just as an aside, I've been... People have tried quite often to put me straight on that and said, no, Chris, when you behave in this way, you open the door to demons or, or, or jinn, so evil spirit, which from a meta historical point I'd exactly agree with but whether I actually I, this is where it gets complicated between Ale, re, re, I don't know if people mean it re, really even though there's not a word or allegorically <laughs> um, so for me I knew what caused it and when I stopped taking the drugs the psychosis just would leave me with it with, with, within sort of 24 hours yeah but what 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 do we feel brings it on then in somebody that's let's just say living a fairly regular life so psychosis is it doesn't have it's multifactorial so it doesn't have one direct cause but there's lots of potential factors that contribute so as, as you'll probably know it runs in certain families but the way that it, it's in clusters of genes, so it's not like an autosomal, autosomal dominant trait, which means that if your father has it or your mother has it, you definitely has it, have it. It's not as simple as that. Because there's clusters, by having more first or second degree relatives uh, with some sort of men severe mental illness like schizophrenia, that increases your chances. So that's one massive factor. You hit the nail on your head yourself with another massive factor, which is drug use. So certain drugs like um, skunk cannabis, as opposed to ordinary cannabis, amphetamines, crystal meth, are far more likely to cause psychosis compared to, for example, heroin or alcohol, uh, especially if people use them in their adolescence for long periods of time. So those are, those are t probably the two biggest factors. And then outside of that, there's things like trauma, so childhood trauma, and also trauma when people are older, when they flip into psychosis. And there's also 
factors that are, are not as well known about, but there is some kind of weak link. So uh, infection in your mother during her pregnancy is a big factor. So studies have shown that, you know, mothers with certain viruses during pregnancy will increase the chance of their offspring having schizophrenia. So yes, yeah, so there's lots of different factors. And, you know, to be honest, it's random. You can have somebody that has all of these factors and stays quite well. And you can have somebody that doesn't seem to have many of those factors. Like Yasmin is a perfect example who suffer from psychosis completely in Explicably. Gosh, do you think, or how much it has been shown that diet plays a factor? Um, I, I wouldn't say that diet in, in itself plays a big factor in terms of psychosis. So that's just for your viewers, for those who don't know, because I think psychosis is a term that's often misunderstood. It kind of gets mixed in with you know violence or you know people acting erratically. A psychosis is a period of mental illness so it's not like a personality disorder which is entrenched it's it's a separate period from which is different from somebody's baseline and it's usually in the forms of uh, hallucinations so hearing voices is very typical in something like schizophrenia or delusions which are fixed beliefs that uh, will not change even if evidence is given to the contrary mostly in the form of, of paranoid delusions in schizophrenia so yeah so diet in itself doesn't really make that much difference but Diet can can make a difference in your overall well-being and your overall mental health. So, if somebody's prone to depression, for example, then it might it's it's more likely to cause a relapse into something like depression rather than psychosis. Mm-hmm. And um, you've got a wonderful YouTube channel. Do you want to just give it a shout out so everyone can find it? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. So it's called A Psych for Sore Minds. And it's basically me talking about what I do for a living. So I talk about mental illness and I talk about criminality and like the crossover between the two. So sometimes I talk about high profile true crime cases, some people that everybody would have heard of, like, for example, you know, Charles Bronson, Ronnie Cray. And I give my own personal psychoanalysis. Sometimes I talk about recent news events. Um, Sometimes I talk about ex-patients, like I've done a video on Yasmin. Sometimes I talk about uh, individual diagnoses. So we've been talking about drug-induced psychosis. I've got a video up there about a real-life story of a Wu-Tang Clan uh, affiliate member who got a drug-induced psychosis and actually cut off uh, half of his penis. So that literally happened about seven or eight years ago. So, yeah, I, I have lots of different... Uh, angles that I that I explore they're about sort of 15 to 20 minute videos quite short and pithy and snappy and uh, I think entertaining hopefully so please do check it out yes gosh you're gonna cut cut off half your winky you better make sure you've got enough to cut off in the first place (laughs) gentlemen not 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 recommended and let's talk about Charles Bronson then Uh, from my limited sort of knowledge i think i saw the film that was made about him or at least one of them he seemed he seemed a a victim of the system to a certain extent didn't he so what i think is interesting about charles bronson is that he was actually when he first got incarcerated i say incarcerated because he he jumped between hospital and prisons uh, numerous times so he's in a bit of both he was only actually in there for seven years for armed robbery which is not that long a period of time especially for compared to most people who end up in broadmoor which he did but what's interesting about him is his actions in after he got locked up have kept him locked up and i think that he well it's obvious that he just loves a punch-up and he, he loves violence anyone can tell you that but what i think is unique about him is i think he actually used violence to increase his status and to make him a celebrity because he is very charming uh, and lots of people know who he is and that's because of his violence because he does such outlandish things from beating up prison guards to taking multiple people hostages to you know having rooftop riots uh, he was friends with reggie cray uh, sorry ronnie cray they made a film about him as you said in fact i think they've made a couple of films about him he even got married when he was behind bars he's he's released exercise books while he was behind bars and in my opinion all of that is uh, basically is is tethered to the fact that he is such a celebrity and he used his fist to get that notoriety so i think he's actually used violence to become famous and i think he he kind of he loves the attention that gets him his celebrity friends that gets him these interviews and so if he stopped being violent then he would lose his mystique he would lose his celebrity so yeah that's what i think makes him unique compared to most other patients in broadmoor or most other prisoners 
would we say he's has a mental illness or is he just like he just has a penchant for violence <laughs> so he was diagnosed by some psychiatrists as having schizophrenia and some say that he didn't and others said that he had psychopathy so he was a psychopath from what I know about him, the schizophrenia is hard to judge because he has had some very odd delu uh, beliefs that could have been delusional, very odd behavior. But you could argue that he did that for attention. But I do think he's probably a psychopath and I'll tell you why. So the, the term psychopathy, again, is sometimes misunderstood. I think people only associate it with, you know, people that break the law and are violent. Um, which isn't actually the case. In fact, most people who break the law and who, who are violent are not psychopaths. To be a psychopath, you have to not only lack empathy, not care about the difference between right and wrong, not care about the law, but you have to be quite charming and manipulative. And I think Charles Bronson absolutely was those things. So if you see him in interviews, he's you, you, there's something you know very uh, attractive about his personality. You know, he flirts with, with female interviewers. He keeps you engaged. And I think you could argue that he is manipulative in a way because he's manipulated his environment. He's manipulated the opportunity to be violent, to become a celebrity. So I think he's a classic psychopath, absolutely. Let's explore, um, Ben, the... the the, I, I mean, it's an area I'm fascinated in, again, is psychopaths and sociopaths. Mm. Because I'm trying to always make sense of what, what the hell is going on outside my window. And anyone that looks at the behaviour, let's say, of politicians for the last 18 months, but then, but then who, whoever's controlling these trillion dollar corporations that that quite clearly are controlling the politicians at what at what stage does it just go from being naive greedy stroke power hungry um to sort of a, a mental illness you know so 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 I mean, I call them psychopaths, but you could e equally, I mean, they may well equally be a, a sociopath. Yeah. Okay, so there's a few things there. I'm, I'm just going to write this down so I don't forget. Um, so first of all, I'll tell you about the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath, and then I'll tell you about exactly what you talk about. So, uh, you know, CEOs and big, big multi multi-organization uh, leaders and how that all ties in so the the term psychopathy is a clinical term so it's used in forensic psychiatry it's used in in the kind of reports that I, and evidence that i give in court whereas being a sociopath is more of a, a kind of informal term so what i'm saying is is if you asked you know 10 forensic psychiatrists what a psychopath is they'll give you the same answer whereas if you asked 10 um, sociologists what a sociopath is, they might give you slightly different answers because there's no, there's no strong definition. But what they've got in common is that they, they, some of the things I mentioned before, they're both manipulative, they both don't care about the law and they will use other people for their own advantage and they don't have empathy, so they don't care if they hurt people. The difference between a sociopath and a psychopath is that psychopaths are more cunning and more manipulative. So if you pissed off a sociopath for any reason, he is more likely to react there and then. He'll get angry, he will shout at you, he will uh, lose his temper, he might attack you, classically. Whereas a psychopath is much more calculated and you could argue much more uh, dangerous. So they won't necessarily lose their temper at you, but they'll, they'll remember it and they'll harbor that ill feeling and they'll wait for the, the perfect opportunity to get you back. And it might be weeks later, it might be months later. So a lot more calculated. And psychopaths tend to be a lot more cold and be able to con contain their emotions as opposed to being reactive. So that broadly speaking is, is the difference, although there's a huge overlap. What I think is quite interesting about what you said is that it's well known that psychopaths make really good CEOs. So psychopaths, there's a, a, a kind of classic trope that they're all violent offenders and actually they're not. Some do really well in the corporate world because they're willing to do whatever it takes to, to kind of stab their colleagues in the back. I've done um, a whole series of videos on my channel about psychopaths and I talked about working for a boss and who in my opinion was a psychopath because some of his actions just were... Um, not only were they really deviant and mischievous, but they were, they were frankly illegal. And, and this, this man was like a CEO of a, of a company. Um, was there something else that you asked me? I've, I've kind of lost my train of thought, Chris. No, I, I find the whole thing 
Oh, sorry, I remember what it was. Sorry. Um, you asked about how does it, where does it become a mental illness? Yeah. And my answer to that would be that psychopathy is a personality disorder as opposed to a mental illness. So as I was saying before, psychosis is, is stepping out of your baseline. So it's when you're different and you're having different experiences from your baseline self. Whereas a personality disorder, psychopathy being the one we're talking about, but you've probably heard of borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic, etc. A personality disorder is entrenched. So it's not something that's a chemical imbalance. It's not something that I can fix by giving you tablets. It's something that's part and parcel of, of who you are. And it's born from sort of childhood experiences and, and your uh, moral compass as you're, as you're maturing. Gosh, there's so much I want to unpick and explore here. And I, I'm, I don't want to lose people. Um, would we be right in saying, so it was always explained to me that a sociopath so a psychopath is somebody that's born, as you said, with a personality disorder. It, it. Not quite born, Chris. I wouldn't say they're born with it, but their early experiences, so throughout childhood, adolescence, can form, can form uh, psychopathy, yeah. Okay. So they can be relatively normal as a child. I'm not saying they all are, but, but it's not unusual for somebody to be relatively stable. Then there might be a change in their circumstances, you know, classically that they, their parents divorce and they go to live with, you know, an evil stepmother who treats them horribly. And that's where their personality disorder uh, develops. Yes. And sociopath, could it be said that if, if you've never known love, then you can grow up and not be able to extend, not, you know, you don't possess empathy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I fully agree with that. So they say that sociopath, sociopathy is a little bit more, even though there's a huge overlap, it's more about learnt behaviour than psychopathy. So yeah, so people or children model what they see, right? So if they're growing up in a household that's full of domestic abuse, full of violence, full of aggression, hostility, then they model that. They, they think that is the correct way to resolve conflict. And they think that there has to be like a, some sort of power dynamic in all relationships in the future. So yep, yeah, so people, children copy that pattern of behavior and they, they find it hard to lack empathy. Yeah. Yes. And do you think society, see, I have this theory that, that when we lived in what my son would call the olden days, so more community-based, small villages, this sort of thing, that if you had a psychopath amongst you, I think you'd soon weed them out. Their behaviour, their manipulative behaviour, I'm guessing would be seen as sort of some sort of wizardry. People <laughs> would realise that they have they have the ability to make people do stuff that's just not nice. And I, I think they would have been um, cast out of the village. Yeah. Well, I um, think, I think psych psychopaths are very good at, at hiding their true na natures and they're very good at being manipulative. So I think you're right. Eventually the village would cotton on, but I think that it would take a long time. So going back to what I was talking about before, as I talked about in one of my, my videos on my channel, when I worked for this boss, I didn't realize that he was, uh, I, didn't, I didn't fully understand why everybody else seemed so scared of him. He seemed so friendly and charming to me. Uh, and it took months for me to kind of get that some of the things he said, so I'll just give you some very brief specific examples. Um, it was a housing association and he would change minutes of meetings that he wasn't there because he didn't like what was being said and because he had an idea. So he would literally ask me and other people for the drafts of our minutes, change them without saying anything and then kind of put them on the, on the shared drives. That's just one very small example. Uh, but my point is, is that I think in, in your analogy, the village would eventually learn, but it would take a while because you know, psychopaths are very good at what they do. Plus, I think you probably, you could argue that the average psychopath might get bored of village life and might go on to make a name for himself, whatever that is, you know, CEO, celebrity, actor, or, you know, murderer, whatever it, whatever it is. They'll, they usually tend to be quite successful, so they'll probably leave the average village. Yeah. I just kind of had this theory that now that we don't live in these close-knit communities, in fact, we could, could argue we've got zero community at all now, all living from our, our home cocoons, that it's and and of course everything's gone online 
has this created an environment where psychopaths can flourish? Yeah, good question, Chris. I've never really thought of how psychopaths would flourish in the social media kind of world. But yeah, I think so. I think so because it's just easier to move on, isn't it? Like you said, if you're if if you get eventually get caught in a small town or a village then everybody's wary of you but if you can just anonymize yourself either online or say in you know a populated city then absolutely you can you can manipulate people get what you need and then move on uh, without being outed mm. so i think you're right yes and do you do, do you know any people that you think might be psychopaths or that you've worked with or that you've you know gotten to know over your life um so gosh i've certainly been made aware of other people's bizarre behavior that that probably like yourself i was quite naive to i mean a guy that i'd say oh he's all right he's a, and someone else would go oh he's he's a, like a real bully really oh he's really nice to me i just didn't didn't see also i had someone i won't say who they are but someone very close to me um was going out with i don't know if psychopath or narcissist is how how interchangeable those terms are but one day he just broke down in front of me and said my god you didn't you know i was he went to therapy about it or for, for a lot of stuff and he broke down and it, it was it was really awful because i hadn't I'd been quite oblivious to it all. But when he told me about this, it was a girl and her manipulative behaviour, it was just bizarre. It was, it, and I, I guess everyone's response is, well, why did you put up with it? But, but the answer is that you don't realise it's done so under the radar, so cleverly yeah. at the time. It, it, am I on the right yeah, yeah that, that does that does sound like somebody that could be a psychopath i suppose um gaslighting might be what you're talking about so it's kind of a manipulation to make somebody think that they're crazy for questioning uh behavior of a psychopath yeah yes see i was a substance misuse specialist for or, or I, I, I worked in a clinic three years as in this role and be quite interesting so I'd have a client and I might say, um, oh, I can't, I, can't, I can't think of a good example, but I, I'd say one thing. I don't know, maybe it, 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 it's, look, this, this approach clearly isn't, isn't working for you. Da, 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 da. And then the next time I saw them, I spoke, they'd say, yeah, do you remember you told me last time, Chris, that I'm I'm way too smart for this kind of treatment? I'm, I'm like, no, I, I, that's no, I didn't. Oh yeah, and you said, and it, and that thing where people try to nail you down on something yeah. that you only sort of said, cat. I mean, I've had it on the podcast. I can't say the person's name because I think people would be quite shocked. But had someone phone me up and say, right, when's our podcast coming out? And I. You know, I had to sort of break it to them that, uh, well, I'll, my manager will be the decider of that. Thank you. No, 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 no. You said Wednesday. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Why would I tell you when I'm, how I'm going to run my business life? That it, you don't even factor into it, unfortunately. Yes, yeah. you did. You said, I said, no, you're referring to the fact that you probably said, when's our podcast coming out? And I would have said something like, oh, you know, try and get it out this week if, if possible. But I didn't, you didn't know, commit to it. Do, yeah. do you get what I'm saying? And they've, yeah. taken, they've taken it literally that I might have said, oh, you know, may, may, maybe maybe even in a couple of days. And they've gone, right, Monday, Tuesday, when? And then to them, you to, to this individual, he, he, he just thought I told him, oh, if you son. Yeah, it's quite interesting, especially when I told him to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, strange. Yes. What um, would 
was there pressure on you to become a, 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 a doctor? We kind of associate um, Asians with that <laughs> parental, you know, doctor, yeah. lawyer, accountant. I, I'm, unfortunately, yeah, yeah I, I exactly was the stereotype, yeah. So I... I, I think it's fair to say I was quite immature when I was a, a lot younger. So around the age where you have to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life in terms of, you know, university courses. So around GCSEs, I couldn't care less. I had no kind of plan, no idea. I didn't even think about the future. Um, and I was fairly smart. So my parents, uh, they did, I think it's fair to say, pressurize me into doing medicine. Um, got into medical school when I was 18, just messed around the entire time, didn't really have any kind of plan. Almost failed all my exams when I got there because I went a bit kind of crazy with uh, a lot more freedom but just about uh, I was like percent one or two percent away from having to re reset the entire year where, for my first year but then started taking it a little bit more seriously and then after I finished medical school I just had again no kind of um, plan of what I was going to do for the future I actually did a year of working as a, sur a surgical house officer and then I did a year of A&E in um, out in Sydney and while I was out in Australia, I got offered to do a six month placement in a psychiatry ward uh, as a junior doctor. And I just instantly fell in love with it. Um, and I think I fell in love with it because there's something a bit fascinating about, about going into other people's delusional world. So I'd, sp I'd speak to these people with diagnoses like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. And it's just, yeah, there's no other way for me to put it. It's just, you, you're like stepping into somebody else's obviously wrong delusional system plus we saw a lot of people that would be at their lowest ebb so you know post-suicide attempts would be a classic reason for somebody being admitted and I felt to my surprise I was quite good at you know just connecting and showing empathy I didn't really ever get my empathy tested to be honest I never was in a situation where uh, I had to had to express it so I didn't even know I was good at it but I, I was to my surprise and if I'm being perfectly honest um, I, with everything that I lacked in medical knowledge, so I passed my degree, but I wasn't the hardest studier. For everything that I lacked in psychiatry, it's more about your uh, communication and your patient skills, your bedside manner. Uh, and I had that more than I had all the knowledge that um, I should have accumulated over the years. So I just had a natural affinity to psychiatry. And then fast forward a few years when I came back to the UK to do my training. Uh, within the placements you get, there's lots of subspecialties. So, you know, there's child and adolescent psychiatry, old age psychiatry, and forensics is one that's not really known about. It's kind of slightly secretive, slightly dark. There's not that many forensic units compared to general adult units because, as you'll know, they're reserved for the highest risk, most dangerous patients. And I kind of did a six month placement there on a whim as a junior doctor before I had to decide what to subspecialize in. And I was just fascinated by the backstories. So every single person there had a reason why they had become a criminal and had a reason why they had become mentally unwell. Often the same factors, so, you know, poverty, homelessness, drug use, uh, really bad parenting from, from their caregivers. Um, and I think I've always been fascinated in, with criminality from listening to gangster rap to, you know, watching gangster films and mob films when I was a kid. So it all kind of for the first time in my life, it all came together and I, I finally came across something that I wanted to do for a living. Yes. So I worked in a forensic unit. Uh, friends at home, I was, um, I was on what they call the staff bank for the NHS for, uh, it was about on and off for three years. And that just meant that when they needed someone, they'd call me and I'd, I'd say yay or nay to take in a, a shift. And... A few of the shifts I did was at was at one of these. I, I, I would have called it a severe mental health unit, but but I guess it's the forensic unit that you're you're talking about. And basically, most of the men in there had killed their wives. Right. Um, and was that a coincidence? Because that seems like a very specific kind of offence. Like, yeah, was it, it a, a, uni a unit especially for people with that presentation? Yeah, I don't think it was. I just think that may, maybe I got my, I, I got maybe I'm getting false memory syndrome, but it certainly was an issue in as in as far as um, you know that they, they hadn't gone out actively to find someone and kill them, as say maybe the Yorkshire Ripper. Yeah. However, in a domestic environment, it had come out that they killed their partner. 
and I don't know how much of, you know, I'm going to plead insanity on this one and, um, or how much of just, uh, I'm guessing if you're severely mentally unwell, you have that ex- a, a period of that in your life, the person who's probably first to suffer is going to be your partner, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you, you're in, under the same roof with them. Perhaps it was, it was that. One- and can I ask you, how, what did you make of the patients? Like, uh, the reason I'm asking this is because something I get asked often is, is what are the people like, especially people who have committed such horrific acts? So what did you make of them? Did you find them to be, you know, difficult, hostile or normal, calm? No, but, um, not hostile at all, although there was one chap that was seriously unwell um, to the point where it was it made you feel uncomfortable as a human being to see someone that unwell. Yeah. Um, by far the majority of the rest, if not all, just on first appearances just came across as absolutely normal human yeah. beings and um you know i'm talking mentally normal and so one chap i sat down with and you know you have your tv room don't you and you try and have a bit of a a yap with your with with your patient and um and it it started off we were having a chat it was all fairly normal and then in the next breath he said um yes yeah, so the president bush is is uh, visiting the city next week to op- to open the dockyard and uh, yeah i'm going to be petitioning him about um so and so and it rolled off his tongue so much it took me a second to realize hang on he's just gone completely delusional yeah um and and you know not not, not an issue but what happened next did become an issue yeah is that he, he for whatever reason you know our chat ended and we went our separate ways the next thing I know, one of the female staff was tapping me on the shoulder and she was saying, Chris, are you all right with this? And I said, sorry, what What do you mean? She said, this. And I turned around and I'd been oblivious to the fact this guy had gone away um, and he, what we term in the profession, he was on one, right? You know, he, 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 he and, and he, and then I realised he, he was screaming down the corridor at me. Um, and when I started to focus and pay attention, he's, I become the focus of his del- delusion or his, his behaviour. Yeah. And the next thing, he just ran down the corridor and the nurse had purposely shut the, the shockproof glass windows. Yeah. You know, it's like almost like bulletproof sort of level glass and the guy just slammed into it smashed you know the 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 glass which all held itself together and then just proceeded to smash himself into that then then he turned and started smashing himself into the window i won't even say the stuff that he was saying because it was just poor guy you know poor guy but it was all lots of sexual stuff was coming out so was he, was he, did he have like paranoid delusions against you specifically? So he thought you did or said something he, he, against he, him? It was like he de- developed a fixation on me. I don't yeah. mean sexual or anything, just like a, I'd become the object of, of his, um, look at me, Chris, Chris, look at me, smash. And he smashed into the window. And, and uh, so, and I was, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I've seen a bit of the world, so I'm, um, just you know what what can you do I, I took it on the chin and i said to this fellow nurse i said no no i'm fine i'm just you know obviously yeah. not not nice for this gentleman so I, what happened in the end do they have to like give him some prn medication or inject him or well i don't remember that particular incident and what i will say is i only ever saw someone injected once and it was a horrible experience I yeah. didn't like it and I didn't know if I really thought it was necessary. Yeah. Um, there was kind of a, um, a a culture in the units I worked in of what I call like bother boot culture, where, where I always used to wonder why are mental health work n- um, nurses all wearing Doc Martens? It just didn't seem 
I just wore my trainers, right? And they're all yeah. dressed like they're, they're in, they think they're in the army or something. Then when yeah. I saw it kick off and I saw how everybody, it was almost like they couldn't wait to all dive on this 70 year old lady. Really? And, you know, it just looked like uh, what I would call small man syndrome. The blokes okay. that just couldn't wait to. But going back to this other client, I rocked up for work. A few days later, I again, accepted a shift, went into the office where, as, as you know, you know, the doctor gives a briefing before before the shift commences, go through every um, starts going through the patient. And I, I just turned around and said, oh, how, how's John? And everyone, I just realized everyone had just turned to look at me and one of the nurses went, oh, uh, John took the train. I went, oh, eh? what, gone to see his family? Because some of them had day, re you know, despite this seriousness, some of them had yeah. day release and stuff. I said, oh, I've gone to see his family. They went, no, it, 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 it's a euphemism. We And I realised what they were saying. He'd thrown himself in front of a train. Wow. So, he, it, it, was he dead? Did he kill himself? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is the same guy that you're talking about that yeah. got agitated, wow. Okay. So in the few days between this happened, and I guess that it's, it's that thing where when you become lucid again and you can look back and realize, oh my God, I was behaving like that and I had no control over it. And yeah. I, don't, I don't want to behave like that. Yeah. And the, the upset of it all meant he went and topped himself. Wow. Um, That's really sad. Uh, do, you, do you mind if I just cover a few issues that you've you've raised for your viewers? Mm. I, I know you'll know this, but I thought they might want to know about stuff like when people get injected and when people have leave. Yeah, please do. Um, so uh, I mentioned before about this girl, Yasmin, who we had to inject against her will. When people are detained under the Mental Health Act in these units, then if necessary, we do have the power to restrain them and inject them. It's not ideal. And as you said, it's, it, it doesn't particularly help with the patient clinician uh, relationship. So medication is always the best way. But if somebody completely lacks insight and if they're a danger to themselves and to other people, then, the, then you either do nothing, in which case that'll never change. They're going to be there you know, potentially for the rest of their lives or get worse, or you have to bite the bullet and, and physically restrain them and give them depot. So there's sort of two different types of injections as you're a quick acting sedative, which is just to calm them down in that moment. So it sounds like the man you were talking about, John might have needed that at that time. And then there's longer acting depot antipsychotics, which stay in your bloodstream and, and build up over time. And uh, they're usually about every two weeks or every four weeks. Um, <clears throat> and then, in terms of leave, so most people, especially in secure units, when they very first arrive, as, as you all know, Chris, um, they don't have leave straight away. But if they're deemed to be settled and if they're engaging in therapy, I wouldn't say their symptoms have to be completely uh, assuaged, but at least if their symptoms are controlled with the right medication, then they're usually given small periods of leave. So it can either be escorted, uh, which is with a nurse or two nurses within the sort of town center or the local area or unescorted if they're a bit more stable so when you were telling your story i did have to wonder like was it the right decision to allow this man to have leave if he was that agitated if, if i was the consultant in charge i would have well i've got the opinion for the rest of my team but I'd, I'd be very much of the opinion that if somebody's that agitated and that paranoid then you know they shouldn't be having leave until you can at least see them settled for a number of weeks yes very much but it, and, it, sorry well, I was just going to say the environment is also that particular unit was quite nice because it was a small unit. Um, it didn't have the sort of horrible kind of miasma that you had when you worked in the main hospital um, yeah. and the main the, the annex of the hospital. That's the mental health unit is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And in there, you permanently had this kind of smell of urine. Um, everyone seemed to chain, or not everyone, but you know, a lot of people just seemed to want to chain smoke. Yeah. And I was there when back when you could smoke indoors, and also when when they started to ask people to go to go outside. Um, and I guess what I'm get, getting to, Shaham, is it was a, it was a very sad environment. Yeah. 
very sad, not a pleasant place to work. Well, I think maybe my perspective is a bit different from yours, potentially, Chris, because I think if you were doing bank shifts, you were probably coming on towards and seeing sort of snapshots of patients in between days. And, and you know, you're right, it, it can be a bit slow, the turnover is slow, the progress is slow, and it can be depressing. I suppose I've had the advice, because I've been doing it for a while, and because I've you know had a regular job as a consultant uh, psychiatrist on these wards, I have seen some patients eventually progress and leave hospital uh, to get to discharge. And it's slow, you know, the average admission in a medium secure unit might be anything from, say, three years to five years. Uh, but when you look at how they were when they first arrived, they were very, very dangerous, had extremely severe symptoms, probably had committed quite serious violence. And then when they when they leave at the point of discharge, almost by definition, they're kind of reintegrated. They've gone through all this therapy. A lot of them have gained qualifications in hospital. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I can understand why it does look a bit solemn and it, it and I have experienced that myself but I think you have to look at the rehabilitation process as a whole and realize that the system's there for a reason yeah no I I, I more was getting to the point that like I reckon if it was in Sweden it would look more like a four-star hotel <laughs> um quite quite sort of dated in 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 that hospital yeah um what's what's the situation then with they say black men statistically experience a higher proportion of mental unwellness. Yeah, um, I'm going to answer that question and then remind me, I've got, I want to tell you about a case uh, of a black man who actually got killed by nurse uh, restraint, but I'll come on to that. So yeah, you're absolutely right. There's, there was, there's been quite a few kind of um, inquests about the treatment of black people within the mental health services and black men have a much higher rate of being detained through the criminal justice system. So uh, in, instead of like your typical journey in to a psychiatric ward, which might be seeing your GP if you're feeling unwell or be taken to A&E, for example, if, you're, if your family are worried that you're suicidal, it, uh, there's a much higher proportion of black men that go in because they're brought in by the police. So that's one issue. The amount of restraint and medication is much higher once they're on psychiatric wards. And also the type of therapy they're given is much more likely to be chemicals and medication than it is to be talking therapy and psychotherapy. So I think there is this huge disparity that exists. I think the problem with that is that it makes some black communities very suspicious about mental health as well, about all authority, whether it's you know police, uh, psychiatrists, mental health services. And the problem with that is that it means that when people are starting to become unwell, whether it's depressed, you know, flashbacks from PTSD to psychosis, they are scared of, of what might happen to them. They're scared of being sectioned, so they don't seek help, uh, which is just such a, a tragic shame because it is potentially, if they were treated at that point, they might have avoided hospital rather than becoming really unwell months down the line when they're so unwell that, that, that they need to be sectioned. Yeah, so I completely agree there is this disparity and, and lots of inquests have shown that. But um, the case I wanted to talk about was is somebody that I've done a video about on, on my channel. He's called Rocky Bennett. And in, I believe it was 1998 in Norwich, in a medium secure unit, um, he was killed by prolonged restraint for some nurses. So what had happened was, uh, according to the inquest, there was an in, institutionalized racism within this particular unit. And he had an argument with a, a white man about using the telephone. And apparently the white man hit him first and they got into a scuffle. But even despite that, Rocky was kind of punished. So he was taken off to another ward and he resisted. I think he punched a nurse on that ward and then he was held down. He was restrained for well over half an hour. And then the inquest found later on that he was actually given a higher dose of medication than was authorised, which probably contributed to his uh, difficulty breathing. Because as you'll know, one of the side effects is it slows down your, your uh, breathing rate. And he was held prone uh, with nurses on top of him for so long that he was probably dead for several minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes before anyone even realised that they you know, got off him and they realised he was dead. So not only is that a horrific case, but on top of that, the hospital initially tried to cover it up. So they didn't phone his family. This happened in the evening. They didn't phone his family until the next morning. And the first nurse that spoke to the family said that it was for breathing problems. So they kind of lied or, well, at best twisted the truth uh, hugely. I mean, it was technically breathing problems, but they didn't tell him that he was, you know, they didn't tell them that he was killed in a restraint until it got investigated later. So, 
you know, I think we do have to acknowledge, and I acknowledge as a, a forensic psychiatrist that there are people that, that act in just unforgivable ways in, in some places and within these units. Yes. What's the situation with skunk then? And also, is it, um, what's this synthetic weed that they smoke in the prison? Spice. Spice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what's this doing to people's brains? And is it, is, you know, what, what are the, can it be permanent? Um, is it really wrecking people's lives? I'm, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm assuming it is. So uh, skunk is like, as, as you'll know, is like a hydroponic, really strong <clears throat> strain of cannabis. And it does predispose people to psychosis more than other cannabis does. If people smoke it from adolescence, from a really early age, then it's known to kind of shrink or thin the frontal prefrontal cortexes. So on both sides, the front of your brain, which helps with things like memory and forward planning and concentration. Uh, so this is, you know, heavy amounts from a young age. I'm not talking about the average, you know, social user. And as I was saying before, it, it's one of the chemicals that predisposes to psychosis. It's not that only smoking skunk will cause psychosis, but if you have other risk factors like trauma, like a family history, then it's, it's one more risk factor that makes it more likely. And then spice is like a to totally different kettle of fish. So spice is a synthetic cannabinoid. And the reason it's so popular in prison, a number of reasons. First of all, it's really cheap, so you can get quite a lot for not a lot of money. Um, also, it is almost undetectable within drug tests. <clears throat> so when it first arrived in prisons, the drug tests couldn't just didn't have the, the chemical compound to, to catch that particular molecule. And eventually the chemists caught up uh, with the drug producers to find the tests. And then, of course, the drug producing chemists are always one step ahead. So they change the molecules slightly so they don't get caught up. Um, but I have seen a couple of prisoners who have been on spice. And I have to say, it sounds horrific. It looks horrific to me. Uh, they don't seem to be having any kind of uh, fun in any way at all. You know, I've, I'm, I've been around drugs. I've been to festivals, I've been to raves and people, I get why people take drugs. I can't, I can't formally say that I endorse it as a psychiatrist, but I can certainly understand that people are having a good time. They're, you know, chatting, they're high. Uh, but when I've seen people on Spice, they just, they just look really, really agitated. They look kind of seized up, fearful, paranoid, which begs the question, why do people take it? And I'm not sure that I fully know the answer to that. I think for some people being wasted in some kind of way, even a nasty way is better than being sober. So their lives are so miserable or their time in prison is so slow and so boring that they would rather be agitated <laughs> than, uh, than sober, yeah. And the other thing about um, Spice I should mention is it's, it's a lot easier to sneak in. So you can have like um, spray versions of it. So it's been found in children's drawings. So they, they, they spray like a see-through layer on top of children's drawing, so it's it's much easier to sneak in and it doesn't smell compared to something like cannabis. Gosh. And if you if you've done some damage to your brain through drugs, how how repairable does that tend to be? And I can use myself as an example here because I, years ago I took a trip before going into a into a rave club you know a warehouse um evening and i won't go into the f full details what else i took but um I did a bit of a cocktail and the next thing i knew i was having the worst trip that you could have it was awful yeah and so much so i just had to leave this club i don't even know how i got in there i i, I I couldn't envisage how I was going to get past the doorman in the state that I was feeling. It was, and that in itself was causing, you know, more, more sort of fear. But I genuinely feel that night that, that I did some real serious damage. Really? And, and as a result, um, I, it, it triggered like a sort of, anxiety condition okay um and was that still extant like months later so say like six months or a year later was it still yeah i'd say it it was like this before it happened 
I used to smoke weed like everybody, well, everybody I knew back then um, in the 90s in the UK smoked, right? It was a big part of all of you. you if someone didn't smoke, you didn't go around, around their house. And I never had a sort of issue with it. But after this incident, I couldn't smoke marijuana on its own because it just instantly sent me into a, a, an anxiety attack. Yeah. In fact, it's probably why I started drinking a lot is I found if I had a couple of beers, then it rela it, it some, did something in my brain to relax me enough, then I could smoke a joint, which yeah. is the absurdity of, of substance misuse. But so that, that became my thing, right, let's have a couple of beers, then I can smoke, smoke my joint. And, and um, I thought it would sort of wear off but I, I can tell you now, if I was to go and smoke a joint now, I, bang, it would just trigger. I, there's no rationalising it either. Yeah. I can't say right, it's going to be cool, right? Calm, meditate. You've got a lovely joint to smoke. It's going to be wonderful. There's nothing to. Doesn't work like that. The second yeah. I was to puff it, bang, it just triggers that. So um. Yeah. I I. I'd, I'm happy to to give you um, my best guess at an answer. I can't I can't say that I know definitively. I think generally speaking, our brains are quite neuroplastic, which means that whatever changes happen, they can heal quite quickly and quite effectively. Generally speaking, it tends to be people who've used substances for a very long period of time that have a high degree of damage, where the da where the damage is irreversible. So I'm talking about decades and decades of you know drinking or using drugs on an almost daily basis. So it'd be quite unusual for somebody to have an experience like you. So for one bad trip to change their mentality permanently, I'm sure it happens. Like you know, fully believe your story, and I have heard it from other people, but it is highly unusual. With the paranoia, I do wonder if part. I'm not saying this is fully causative, but at least part of it is when people get older, they naturally become a bit more. They have more responsibility, I guess, and more things to worry about, whether that's family, you know, financial responsibilities, work. So I wonder whether there's there's something that's just there's more on their mind in general to be paranoid about rather than because the drugs make them more paranoid. Does that make sense? Because somebody in their 20s doesn't really have that much to that much responsibility versus somebody in their you know 40s. Yeah, I guess something else we need to factor in here as well is, is so I'm a I guess what you call a childhood trauma experiencer. Yeah. So my flight or flight has been a bit, bit you know, it's been screwed with from an incredibly young age, you can say. And I believe that, that, that screwing with it, I do feel it stays, or it's been my experience, it kind of stays with you for life. Yeah. Um, and I imagine you'll, you'll know this far better than I will, Chris, but, Tell me if I'm wrong. I imagine that to a degree you must be keeping a lid on that memory and kind of pushing it down and that experience. And then I wonder if taking, if smoking like quite strong weed might sort of flip it open when you don't want it to be open. So I suppose my question is, do you get like memories pushed to the forefront or would you get like flashbacks when you were smoking weed? I think it's more just it unleashes the flight or fight. You know, it's not, ne it's not about the mem memory per se. It's about the, the fact that you've got a sudden rush of whatever the, you know, I would say adrenaline because it, you can actually buy adrenaline in the chemist in India. It's good, nor, nor adrenaline, I think it, it, it's just like taking speed. It's, I, 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 I can't say what it's like because we'll be on YouTube, but <laughs> let's just say it's, you know, it's, it, 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 it's ironic that it's not an unpleasant experience. But it's it, it's whatever the chemical is that makes you feel like spooked and shocked. Yeah. Um, that's I'd say it, it it was triggering that. So it won't come as any surprise. Say I I stopped smoking <laughs> a very long time ago now. In fact, I stopped pretty much everything. Um, kind of took me about thirty years to realise that life's actually really really great without that stuff. <laughs> yeah um so uh you heard it here first kids <laughs> yes um shall we finish then shahom on sure. um 
let, let's take the classic case because one of my friends is Richard McCann and his mother was murdered by the uh, Yorkshire Ripper. Right. Um, and that was a fascinating, well, a terrifying and fascinating situation case, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And what what would his diagnoses be, do you think? So that, that's, that's a very interesting question. And actually, I have done a video on him on my channel as well. So Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, what's interesting about him is that I think that he was psychotic during the time that he killed that he went on his killing spree he killed not not exclusively but often killed sex workers and he had a number of bizarre experiences that he reported so he reported a voice telling him that he had to kill sex workers uh, even after his arrest he expressed some bizarre delusions i think he said that he believed he met the queen uh, in the pub and he had experiences of of like meeting people that he thought were related to the devil and significantly, he didn't just say this during, you know, his trial when he was being assessed. He said it kind of consistently even after he'd been arrested and sent to prison. So what what was unique about his case is that the, a number of psychiatrists said that he was psychotic, that he had schizophrenia and that he wasn't criminally responsible for his actions. Uh, and despite that, the judge overruled that and he basically didn't take the advice of the psychiatrist and said that he was criminally responsible. So he ended up going to prison, but then, then he spent a couple of years in prison during which time, as you might know, he was attacked by a couple of inmates. And then about two years later, he was deemed psychotic and he was transferred to Broadmoor, which is a high secure psychiatric hospital. And to me, it doesn't make sense that somebody is seemingly psychotic, diagnosed as psychiatrist as psychotic, then suddenly becomes well during his trial, then becomes psychotic two years later and is sent to Broadmoor. Um, to me, it makes far more sense that he was probably psychotic the entire time, but due to political reasons, because what he did was so heinous, uh, it, it was a political decision, I think, that the judge thought, well, you know, the public are baying for blood here, so we, he has to be seen to be punished. Mm -hmm. So I think that he had schizophrenia, and I think he was psychotic. doesn't mean he wasn't criminally responsible. He, he probably, uh, I couldn't say for definitively without assessing him in person, but he probably did know what he was doing, did know what he was doing is wrong, which is the basis of the insanity plea, uh, but probably arguably should have been sent to Broadmoor, uh, which I think some people is just a, an easy ride, but it's not. It's, it's not a prison, but it's a hospital, but it's still, you know, geared up for rehabilitation, but it's still, you know, locked, secure environment. So I think he should have gone there in the first place. Mm. Yes, you can imagine that judges don't always make the best decisions, do they? I think they probably feel a lot of pressures on them to be seen to do what they believe. Then, of course, you've got the fact that most people don't understand mental illness and... and um, yeah, and and a decision just sending someone to prison to be nasty and show the public look, look, that that's not helping because that's that's just setting a precedent that we're not prepared to understand people that that are unwell through no fault of their own, are we? I think sometimes it depend like it shouldn't this shouldn't be the case, but I think it is the case. It kind of depends on the sympathy that the average person has for the perpetrator. So I mentioned before, I keep coming back to this case of Yasmin, this 18 year old girl who killed her nephew. Uh, it's very easy to be sympathetic towards her because she had no history of offending, never, you know, uh, never hurt anybody before, no drug and alcohol use. What she did was completely, completely out of character, completely inexplicable. So it's easy for us, when I say us, I mean me, the public, the judge to, to believe that she's mentally unwell. What when it becomes more complicated is when you get somebody like Peter Sutcliffe who has done something horrific so many times over a long period of time, it's easier for the average, uh, so it's harder for the average person to accept that mental illness might be driving that. It's easier to say, well, what he did's horrible, you know, uh, lock him up and throw away the key. And I get that, I, c I can understand that way of thinking, but as you say, it doesn't help us really get down to the root of the problem and it doesn't help us cure those that need curing. No. Yeah, the last two things I, I, I wanted to um, cover while I've got your your professional expertise at hand. Um, one of them is what 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 what's your um, thinking on why somebody commits suicide? Um, well, 
I think it is complicated and you have to take it on a case to case basis. Uh, it's a little bit, I guess, like we were talking before about becoming psychotic. I think it's multifactorial and there's so many different factors. So it could be related to actually having a mental illness like depression. So contrary to popular belief, actually quite a lot of people who commit suicide don't necessarily have a deep depression. So I mean, you know, something that's dark and pervasive that has been there for months or years. Sometimes it could be a reaction to an event. So having a serious mental illness, substance use is another massive factor, childhood trauma, um, the social support they have at that time, obviously individual life events like, you know, losing a job or breaking up with with a a long-term partner, for example, plus you know, flashbacks of childhood trauma they might have experienced. So I think I don't think there's one particular cause, but I think there's lots and lots and lots of different causes. But I think maybe probably the biggest psychological process is, is hopelessness for the future. So if you don't see that your future is going to... if it, Being low or being depressed is one thing, but if you're low and you don't see it ever getting better, whether that's reality or, or you know clouded by depression, I think that's probably the biggest factor that leads to leads to somebody taking their life. Yes. What and do you I think? Talk, well, it's an interesting one, and I, 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 I've known a lot, quite a lot of people kill themselves now, and sometimes it really is a case of oh my god, just did not. Um, I mean, one of my friends killed himself very recently. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, it, it, but and it. What, sometimes it's a case of, oh my God, now it's happened. I see the build up. I see this. I can see the signs, but you don't see them at the. At, at, we're all so bloody busy in this trying to make sense of this life, aren't we? And earn our crust and take and and. It, it's really not um, not aligned with looking after your mates. All this constant hours that we have to to put in, and it's ironic considering we've got all this bloody so-called social media that we we're not more more sort of social. But I suppose another issue is it's not always obvious if there are warning signs, right? Because not everybody's some people, especially men, uh, because of you know masculinity, because of the the archetype of being you know a big tough strong guy we're not always open to discussing our mental health and telling people if we're not feeling 100 percent. yeah of course and if i mean heaven forbid but if i was feeling suicidal i'm i'm sure you'd call me out and say all right chris i'm yeah absolutely fine mate no no what no you know and then you just take yourself off and kill yourself there's no you know there's no i think there's no um you, you sometimes can't predict the, these things just for the nature that there's no real sort of logic to it. But um, yeah. if you're a, it's a bit of a morbid topic, but if you're interested, Chris, and if you've got the time, I, one of the very first videos I did on my channel was interviewing a great man called John Clark, who was an ex-cop who um, suffered PTSD from the stuff that he saw in his line of duty. And he attempted suicide Um, ended up being stopped by his very colleagues that he worked with, literally came and cut the rope down and and saved his life. And then he got sectioned to a psychiatric unit. So I interviewed him about his whole experience and the whole process. So he talked about a lot of the things that we're talking about, about not being able to ask for help and all these pressures of life and work. And yeah, fascinating. It's it's just a way to go that it really is just inherently sad. A friend of mine worked... For the Met Police, and he had to go and cut someone down once. And when they broke into the flat, the chap had simply read like, and it was he'd obviously put it on um, repeat play. So he's hanging there, and he's got holding back the years just on repeat. Now my friend's got to live with that. He, he's got that in his mind now for the rest of his. Every time he hears that song, he obviously can't help but but think about this poor poor chap yeah um the other thing as well is ptsd which obviously being ex-military and well and as as a trauma person myself yeah it is a big thing and i i spend a lot of time explaining to people that although you can have traumatic experiences in the military 
might not even be what you think. It might be that you got bullied, uh, you know, uh, uh, or it might be you, you people closed ranks and you didn't get the promotion that you 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 deserved or whatever. But I tried to explain that most of us joined up with trauma, from what I understand, or, or a significant percentage. It, it kind of goes hand in glove with then wanting to prove yourself in the military. Or, or the, and then I've no doubt that situations you can experience in combat maybe compound the issue. Yeah. Um, but it's more the fact that when we leave the forces and we leave that secure cocoon and we hit real life where no one's paying your mortgage for you, no one's giving you free health care, no one's putting up when you, you know, when you want to drink to cure all your woes, which is what, what we were taught to do. And then, and then you've got to work for a civilian employer who to you is just a dick because they're, you know, the rules are different and the rules are very different. There's the, the loyalty that you may, may or maybe you may not have known can, can be different and it takes some real adjustment. I mean, yeah. one thing, we, we kind of always chuckle about is it is as a civilian, you can't just go and punch people. That was how we sorted things out. You know, yeah. I remember I nudged into someone on the basketball court once and we had a bit of like, yeah, yeah. God. When I was having, you know, I was, I'd got out the shower and I was just getting dressed and the guy just walked in bang like that. And the next thing you're, you know, you're, you're in a fight. That's just how we, how we did. So, yeah. but, but going back to the point I was making is that it, 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 there's not enough focus on the childhood trauma that's driving this behavior. That's then leading to so many service personnel taking their own lives. Yeah. And the public have almost a romantic view uh, or a heroic view that it's, this is all about combat that you've seen this and, and, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen and that's not horrendous, but it, we're we're probably missing the the more important factor here. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so I th I, I've not really got that much experience. I do have experience of people from the military who have got PTSD who've gone on to commit offences. I've done some of those ass assessments, but you're possibly one of the first person that's talked about having childhood trauma that was kind of added onto or accentuated those later traumas. I think part of the problem was there's a few things that make it really difficult. One of the issues is that most people, when they're kids, they won't, I mean, we talked about men not talking about their feelings. It's even harder for a child to talk about their feelings of trauma uh, because they might feel like they're betraying their parent or whoever was involved in that trauma. Um, and I suppose another issue is that the, like all mental health services, the child and adolescent services, the CAM services are really squashed and the waiting lists are getting so long that unfortunately only children with very severe mental illnesses tend to get the attention and the service that they need. So people with what might be seen as less severe, and obviously it's got potential to build into something more severe like PTSD in the future, but we don't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they get kind of swept under the carpet. So you can see how it's a perfect storm for people to be in your situation where things escalate over time. Yeah. Yeah, and the issue here and i've done obviously done a lot of thinking about this is see I, I was too young to understand what was happening to me so i didn't have the mental faculties at that age to to be able to make sense of it all yeah and as such i think my brain then so it compartmentalized it and and made it about me so oh i've done something wrong this is yeah. something about me deserves this be, be, behavior and and you tuck it away in, in in such a deep place in your brain at that young age that you yeah. don't have set, you know, you can't rationalize it out. As an adult, if someone hurts you, you can go, well, listen, he's probably having a bad day or he had a bad childhood himself or, or you know, it's not me personally. He probably would have done this to anybody. You, you have that ability to rationalize. But of course, when you're maybe two years old, yeah. three for you don't and especially if in a culture like when i was young adults people didn't recognize this sort of stuff it wasn't something you talked about yeah um i remember a, a gypsy at the fairground once come up and s s s like 
punch me in the ear. I think it was a mistaken identity. I think he thought I'd done something to his ride or something or his his amusement art and it and it wasn't. I was just walking on and this gypsy come out and went bang. And so when I hooked back up with my mum and I was about I don't know about ten or twelve years old by that stage and I'm holding she said, What are you holding your ear for? I said, Oh that that bloke just hit me. She said, What? Why didn't you tell me? Well, Shaham, I didn't tell her because I didn't know that wasn't normal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't know, it didn't occur to me to tell her. I'm just like, oh, you know, it basically, it, it, you know, it, it's got sort of happened again sort of thing. But um, yeah. well, that's very sad. So where's your future? Uh, where does your future lie? <laughs> well, that's a big question. Um, I think in terms of my professional work, so, you know, working as an expert witness, I'm pretty happy where, where things are, really. I don't particularly want to change anything. I'm getting a decent amount of cases. I find it interesting. I'm getting a, a good throughput of work. Um, my plans are to try and grow my media profile, which I've only been doing actively, I'd say, for a year. And it's a massive struggle. It's, it's such, such hard work. It's such a crowded marketplace, as I'm sure you can attest to. So, yeah, just trying to get um, more attention with my YouTube channel, trying to make videos regularly. I release two a week. Uh, I've got a book coming out, um, which is going to be published by Sphere Publishing in, in March of next year. And I'm doing little bits and pieces of um, documentaries. I'm on Channel 5 this coming Thursday, giving sort of sound bites for programs here and there. Um, and I think we talked about this before we, we went live, but right now it doesn't feel like it's worth it because it's just, I'm just really busy and, and it takes up a lot of time, but I acknowledge that I have to be a bit more patient and that these things do take a while to build up. So I've got to stop thinking about the results for now and just putting in the effort and, uh, yeah, just be more patient, I guess. So that's my future, a failed media star. Yes. No, you're doing very well. I mean, you, you, you've, I think if I ever was, um, if I ever was ill again, I'd want the doctor who was as nice as you to, to uh, come and treat me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, I'll give you and, a discount. Yes, thank you. And you see, you've certainly got the, you know, the presence for, for, for the media. So I think, um, yeah, keep the faith. If, um, what my friend say, he'd say, there's a there's a much higher power going on here and we we just we're just a channel for that and if you if you ever doubt that try to imagine how you got this big right, if you say to people how did you get to you know five foot eight six foot 200 pound whatever that they'd say well i ate stuff you, no 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 like how did you actually like build yourself you know what, what molecule did you you know well i didn't and it's like, yeah, you you literally didn't do anything, did you? And yet you went from an egg and a sperm to this incredible creation. And so you have to acknowledge that there's something much bigger going on here, isn't there? <laughs> so I've got that philosophy now with, with everything. I just do my best. I don't sweat the small stuff. And I think if you've got a good heart and you clearly have, the rest gets taken care of. That's very nice of you. I hope you're right. We'll see. Give it yes. a couple of years. Hope I'm right too. <laughs> sure, Hon, maybe um, we do a live show one one Friday night or something, and I'm sure that my subscribers will have lots of questions. And um, it's always quite fun. It's a bit like a Friday in the pub without actually being in the pub. Uh, absolutely. Then, I'd be up for that. Yeah, yeah. In the Let's YouTube pub. Um, but yes, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you for your, your commitment and, and your insight. And, uh, and uh, yeah, like I say, let, let's chat soon. It's been an absolute pleasure, Chris. Thank you for having me on and also for sharing your story. Um, it's, it was very uh, magnanimous of you for telling us some of your yes. experiences. I can't imagine that's easy. Well, to be honest, I'd, there'll be an overlay over this podcast. So if I point there, I think it is. There's two of my memoirs. One is Eating Smoke, which is... Um, my Hong Kong story when I when I got addicted to crystal meth and became ill. But more fascinating is Forty Nights is the memoir of how I 
sort of moved on from now. I don't like words like recovery because I, I, I think life is just a series of experiences and we should, uh, should make the most of them all, let's say. Yeah. Um, but for anybody out there, it, it, you, it, if, if you're looking for any answers, then, then they might be able to, to help you. And talking of anybody out there, if you could like and subscribe, thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, we'll see you next time. All the best, Chris. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.